Well, hey there, Bridgeway. Good morning, good morning. Hey to you online. We're so glad that you're with us. It's good to be in God's house. If we haven't met before, my name is Judah. I am the young adults pastor here at Bridgeway. So that's just my shameless plug. If you're between the ages of 18 and 25, I would love to connect with you and get you roped into our community. Uh, I'm not bragging when I say we have the best young adults program in the country. uh, And we would love for you to be a part of that if you're in that age group. I am excited to just spend a few minutes in God's word with you. I am feeling good. I'm feeling refreshed. I just got back from Costa Rica. I was in Costa Rica for a week on vacation. Just a side note, vacations are anointed. You ought to partake in them as a spiritual practice. And so I was in Costa Rica for a week and I went with a couple of friends. And one of the friends that I went with works here with me at Bridgeway. And you know, when you're coworkers, you only see, you know, the work hat. And so when we were there, as, as we were coming back, I asked, I asked her, I said, what did you learn about me over this trip that you didn't know before? And she kind of chuckled and said, I learned that you were telling the truth when you said you were an introvert. <laughs> Most people don't believe me when I tell them I'm an introvert just because I have a really big personality and I'm really good at pretending to be comfortable on stage. When we got to Costa Rica, we got there pretty late and uh, you know, we, maybe 11.30 at night, and you know, this is after I'd been through TSA and Border Patrol and Customs, and you know, the people at the airport, they just touch all over you and everything, and I, I was kind of peopled out. And in Costa Rica, we met with another friend of mine who is an extrovert, and if you're an introvert and you have relationship with an extrovert, you know y'all sometimes have a different set of ideas, amen. And so we get there, and this guy says, hey, I met these German students, we should go fellowship. I said, sir, it's it's 11 o'clock. I don't wanna talk to any, I don't wanna talk to the Lord right now, amen. And he wanted to go and, and, and fellowship with them and it just, it just, it aggravated me to no end because I just, I'm an introvert and nothing is worse to me than when you've had a long day, like, I mean, a long day, you know, woke up at five, you know, went to the gym at five, got gas on the way back home, cooked breakfast, got the kids ready, read your Bible, took a shower, paid the bills, got to work, worked from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., sat in traffic from five to six, got home and had to spend quality time with the kids and the wife and water the plants again and feed the cat and pay the bills and get ready for the next day. And finally, you climb into your bed and you're about to go to sleep and somebody calls you because they want something. (laughs) Nothing works my nerves more. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm an introvert all the way to my core. And when I'm tired, nothing appeals to me. I don't want to be asked to do Anything. Our text today begins with some people in that position, some folks who are tired and are being asked to do something. We're going to explore the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's a familiar story, a very famous passage of Scripture. And often when people look at this passage of Scripture, often when it's preached and taught, there's a lot of focus on the miraculous nature of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And that's good because it was miraculous and we should pay attention to that. But what I want to dig our feet into today is the way that Jesus invites his students to participate in what he's doing, the way he invites them to partner with him and what he's getting ready to do. I don't know why God is so bent on human partnership. It would seem to me that human partnership is more of a headache than it's actually worth. I've never been good at partnership, even as a kid, when, when, when I would be assigned group projects, I would beg my teachers, please, Miss Jones, let me do this by myself. And you know, t- you know how teachers are, they won't let you do it. And so I would just gather my group members together and I'd tell them I'm the boss and this is what you get to do and this is what you don't get to do. I've never been group at, good at, at group partnership. I'm real good at dictatorship, but, but partnership is not not my my strong suit, but for some reason, God desires partnership. God desires human participation. And by human, I mean you, you specifically. God desires your participation. In fact, if you're following along on the app or you're just taking notes, this is your fill in the blank. God wants you to join him. God wants you to join him. 
And this miraculous moment where Jesus feeds 5,000 people, it begins to show us just how deeply God desires our partnership. And it begins with some tired and cranky Christians. We're going to read John's account of the story. You can find it in all four of your Gospels, but we're going to be in John. So if you'll turn with me to the book of John, we're going to be in the sixth chapter, John chapter six. I'll be in the ESV, but you can follow along in whatever version suits your fancy. John chapter six, when you have it, say amen. 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 Beginning at verse one. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. In the previous chapters of John, John has spent a significant amount of time accounting for and recording the actions and the deeds and and the behavior and the words of Jesus in the Galilee region, which is north of Judea. And so from chapters one to five in the book of John, you have some really major, powerful, wonderful events that have happened. You have the wedding at Canaan when Jesus turned the water into wine. You have the evangelizing of the woman at the well from Samaria. You have the healing of of the paralytic, the guy who had been paralyzed for 38 years at the pool of Bethsaida. And so from chapters one to five, you have great ministry, you have great teaching, you have great miracles, you have great enthusiasm, you have great excitement. But by the time we get to chapter six, what we encounter is great exhaustion. I don't know if you've ever been exhausted before. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about really exhausted, like just want to climb inside of a hole and not come out until 2024 when your emotional reserves and your mental reserves and your physical reserves are just depleted and you just really don't have anything left. And it's funny because it's often in these moments when we are worn out that God gives us the greatest opportunities for partnership that God invites us to participate in the most meaningful ways. And what I need you to understand is that you being tired does not exempt you from partnership. You don't get to decide not to participate because you're tired. And so Jesus and his students, they have done some incredible work, some incredible missional work, and they're tired. Luke's version of the story says that Jesus went to the deserted place on purpose to get away from the crowds, and the crowds are following him, right? They they will not leave him alone. I'll be honest, these crowds, they sound a little inconsiderate. The man is tired. He's healed your cousin, given sight to your mama, given a voice to your daddy, you know, raised your daughter from the dead. Like, leave him alone. Let him have a day off. The the Greek verbs that we translate to following denote this connotation of a continual following, right? Like no matter where he went, that's where they went. This is is bordering harassment, you understand? (laughs) What really really aggravates me about the crowd is that it's not like they were just following him because, you know, they like loved him and just wanted to have this deep relationship with him. Verse two tells us that they were following him because they saw him performing these miracles on the sick. You ever had somebody that just wanted to be with you because of what you could do for them? That just, that just wanted something from you? It works my nerves. And Jesus and his students are exhausted. But Jesus decides that it is at this point that he wants to offer partnership. Let's pick it up in verse five. Lifting up his eyes and then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Now, I'm often grateful that I I was not part of that first class of Jesus' school of ministry because my attitude would have been real bad if Jesus looked at me and said, Judah, how are we going to feed these people? Excuse me, Lord, like this is my day off. I'm, I'm not feeding anybody, right? I, I, I struggle. It is hard to be asked to participate when you're tired. Nothing is appealing to me when I'm in that place. Fortunately, I wasn't in that first class. I graduated a little bit later. So let's look at what verse six actually says. Jesus said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. 
Jesus said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. Here's what I need you to get. Jesus does not ask us to participate in his plan just because he needs stuff done. In fact, often the getting something done is not the most important part of what Jesus is doing when he invites us to partner. Jesus doesn't just need workers. He doesn't just need hands. He doesn't just need busy people, right? This was not really about feeding hungry people. In fact, the hunger of these people was not even the most critical part. How do we know this? Because if we look at Matthew's account, Matthew's account tells us that the disciples came to Jesus and said, send these people home so they can look in their own pantries and their own refrigerators and make their own dinner, right? And what that lets us know is that they were not so far away from their homes that they could not get there in a reasonable enough time to get something to eat. These are not starving people, right? They're hungry, but these aren't the children from the commercial, you know, that look like if they don't, if they don't eat by the end of the commercial, they're going to die, right? The, the, these are just hungry people. In some of the other accounts of this story, uh, it, it, they say that they had spent the whole day listening to Jesus teach, right? So eight hours, maybe 12 hours. If you don't eat for eight or 12 hours, you're going to be hungry, you know, look cranky. Maybe your attitude is bad, but you're not going to die, right? And this is really important for us to understand because we're about to see Jesus do the miraculous for a non-critical situation. And a lot of times we only expect and believe in the miraculous and in the power of God for dire situations. And if somebody isn't on their deathbed and if it's not the most extreme situations, we don't believe and expect for miracles. But I want to be clear, miracles are not simply God's response to crisis. Miracles are just how God is. They're just how he operates. They're just his personality. Everything God does is miraculous. And I want us to start opening opening our eyes and be looking for and expecting and believing for miracles, even when the situations are not dire. And so Jesus invites his students to participate, to partner, because it's a part of how he forms his students. It's a part of how he shapes us and refines us and calls us into ourselves. And so he asks Philip, he says, Philip, how are we going to feed these people. And I want to be clear that he is asking Philip this because he is genuinely interested in Philip's ideas, in Philip's contributions, but also he already knows what he's going to do. God is not making this up as he goes, and that's real good news for those of us that are asked to partner because we can enter into that partnership knowing that God already has his plan set up. All right, let's see. Where are my... Where are my realists, my rationalists, my pragmatists, my uh uh-huh, my my people who like to study and make sure everything is together and lined up, my people who who like to make sure that we have all the pieces. I'm I'm calling you out because uh, Philip, one of Jesus' students, he's in your camp. My, uh, let's see, if you, if you like, like Myers-Briggs, my INTPs, that's you. Uh, if you like the Enneagram, my ones, my threes, my sixes. Philip is, Philip is in your camp. Let's look at how Philip responds. Verse seven, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. 200 denarii would not be enough for each of them to have even a bite. Now, this is normally the, the time in the, in the group meeting, you know, in the board meeting, where the optimists and the, the, the dreamers and the sevens, they come out ready to fight, right? But I, I don't want us to beat up on Philip because Philip is not being a Debbie Downer here. You, you, we all know people who, just as soon as you throw out an idea, they just throw it away, they just, you know, they just shut it down. That's not what Philip is doing here, right? Philip is actually being logical and reasonable and practical, and his response shows us that he, that he really thought about, he really processed what Jesus had asked him to do. Jesus says, Philip, how are we gonna feed these people? So Philip starts thinking about it, all right, how do we get this done? Come here, Judas. Um, Judas, you're the bookkeeper. How much money do we have in the money bag? 200 denarii. All right, let's calculate 200 denarii, see how much bread we can get. Okay, and how many people are there 
in this space. All right, y'all go count that side. Matthew, James, you go count that side. How many people do we have? Okay, we have 5,000 5, people are in here, but, but 5,000 only counts the men. That doesn't count the women and the children. So, and how much money did you say we have, Judas? Lord, I'm afraid we can't do this. I'm afraid this is just not possible, Lord. We just, we don't have the resources. We just don't have them. It, it, it's just not in the bank. We don't have the resources to buy enough bread to feed all these people. And Lord, even if, even if somehow we found all the money, if we liquidated all the stocks, if we sold all the bonds, if we did a donkey wash fundraiser, if we won the Jerusalem Powerball, like even if we, even if we found all the money, right? Lord, where are we gonna find a bakery that already has 5,000 Hawaiian rolls ready for us to give to the people, right? Like that, like where, how are we gonna, if we had called last week and maybe ordered ahead of time, maybe we could get this, get, get this done. But we, we're not gonna be able to do this. And Lord, I mean, even if, even if we found the money, even if we found, if we found five bakeries within walking distance that had 1,000 rolls each and we somehow were able to transport them all here, Lord, it's only 12 of us. 12 staff members is not enough to cater a dinner for 5,000 people by 6 p.m. I really, I, really, I really understand Philip's position. I mean, I work at a church that's very big but has a very small staff. That's why the same people you see up here preaching, you'll see working the coffee machine, you'll see stacking chairs, you'll see sweeping floors. We have a small staff. I know what it is to have a big project with a small a small staff. I know what it is to work with somebody, to work for somebody who has big vision and big dreams. I remember the first time I got to read Pastor Lance's vision documents for the next 10 to 15 years. He's, he's up at Hume so I can talk about him. I read those documents, y'all. I said, Pastor Lance, we're gonna do what? I almost resigned. I said, the Lord told you what? Is he bringing like 40 new stuff? Like how are we gonna get this done? I know what it is to work for somebody who has big vision. So I wanna be clear, I'm not beating up on Philip for his response. I get it, and sometimes, sometimes when people talk about the miraculous and they talk about God making the impossible possible, they talk like we should completely divorce ourselves from reason and from logic and from practicality. Uh, reason and miracles are not mutually exclusive, right? The Bible tells you that a wise man prepares for what's coming. The Bible tells us to count the cost before you launch into a big project. But here's where Philip made his mistake. When you are counting the cost, when you are counting the resources, when you are counting the money and the bread and the ovens and the hands and all the things, don't forget to count Jesus. As a believer, Jesus is now a part of our equation. And when Jesus is a variable in your equation, your math changes. All of a sudden, things are different than they would have been without Jesus. As a believer, I cannot just think in terms of money and resources and skills and people. I have to get good at doing God math. And the way we do God math is we remember that J in our equation that J that changes everything. What's really cool to me is that we're not asked to do this from like a, a stupid place. You know, we're not, we're not required to be idiots in this, right? Our God has a track record of being real good at doing God math. Our God really likes to show out. I mean, that's just who he is. By our standards, our God doesn't do anything in the simple, normal, straightforward, easy way, right? I'll remind you, it was our God that when Israel was up against the Red Sea with Egypt at their back getting ready to kill them, he could have just sent a boat. That would have been, I think, the most easy and practical thing, you know, just have the Titanic just pull on up and just load the people, get on y'all, come on, Egypt is coming, hurry up, right? But it is our God who would say, no, I will open the seas so that you can reach your freedom. I will make you walk across on dry ground. The Bible says the ground wasn't even wet. It is our God who when Joshua was fighting and losing the battle, our God could have just said, I'm gonna send some reinforcements. I'm gonna make your swords a little bit sharper, but it is our God who would say, I will arrest 
time itself. I will hold the sun in place and tell it not to move so that you can be victorious. It is our God who would say when he wanted to reconcile himself to us, he would say, I will come down in human flesh and hang on the cross with your name on it, with the nails that should have been in your wrist and in your feet so that we can be together. By our standards, our God doesn't do anything normal and straightforward in the easy way. And that's real good news for us and that can allow us to enter into partnership with him hopeful and excited, particularly when it doesn't look like we have enough, particularly when it looks impossible. Why? Because that means that we are prime candidates for the seas to open before us. God calls us into partnerships where we don't have enough on purpose. It's not an accident that you don't have enough to do what God has asked you to do by yourself. Because if you could do it by yourself, it wouldn't be a partnership. That would be a sole proprietorship. God is not calling you to a sole proprietorship relationship with him. He's calling you to a partnership. And so Jesus says to Philip, Philip, how are we going to feed these people? And Philip says, Lord, we can't. But I want to look at Andrew's response. Andrew is another one of Jesus' disciples, and he has another response. Let's pick it up in verse 8. One of his disciples, Simon, uh, uh, sorry, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? You know, I really, I really love this, this little detail, this, this moment between Andrew and Jesus, because it shows that while Andrew also was unclear about how we were going to get this done, Andrew did what he was supposed to do, which was to evangelize. This is an example of evangelism. And often when we think about evangelism, we think big scale evangelism. We think big signs, big billboards, big band, dynamic preaching, big conference. We think real big scale with our evangelism. And that's okay. That has its place in the world, right? But ultimately, evangelism boils down simply to introducing somebody to Jesus, And really, that's all Andrew did. When you read the New Testament, Andrew doesn't have a whole lot of big, fancy, exciting episodes, right? All Andrew was really good at was introducing people to Jesus. And so often, he is kind of overshadowed by other disciples, right? We talk a lot about Peter and how Peter built the New Testament church and how we we exist today because of Peter and his big personality and his dynamic preaching. But we forget that it was Simon who introduced Peter to Jesus. If you go all the way back to John in the first chapter of John in the 40th verse, you'll read these words. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated to the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. This is, this is, what, this is what Andrew did. Andrew introduced people to Jesus. And because Andrew introduced Peter to Jesus, Bridgeway Christian Church exists today. And because we see Andrew do that again with this little boy with the fish and the loaves, 5,000 people ate. This is why you cannot exempt yourself from evangelism. This is why you cannot look at evangelism as somebody else's job. There are people that you are supposed to introduce to Jesus and you don't know what kind of miracles and signs and wonders and blessings God has stored up in the people that you are supposed to introduce to Jesus. This is why everyone has to participate. This is why everyone has to, has to do their part. We all have to play our role. Often when I read this story, I wonder, I wonder what went through the little boy's mind. When Andrew said, give, give me your happy meal, give it to Jesus, I wonder, I wonder what he thought. I wonder if this little boy became insecure when Jesus said, give me what you got. Insecure about what was in his bag. When they look in my bag, they're going to see that my fish are little and they're going to see that I'm probably poor, that I don't come from a rich, wealthy household. I wonder if he got insecure, maybe just about the way he threw the food together. Maybe they're going to see just the particular way I make sandwiches. I wonder if he got insecure about what was in his bag when Jesus asked him to give it to him. 
I wonder if he worried about lack. Like if I give, if I give up my lunch, what will I eat today? If I give up what I got, will I have enough for myself? I wonder if this little boy worried about judgment. What will my mama say if she finds out that I gave up my lunch? What will she think? What will my daddy say to me? Will I be in trouble when I get home? I just wonder, I wonder what he wrestled with. I wonder what went through his mind. I know that those are some of the same things that get in the way for us when Jesus asks us to give him what we got. We worry about insecurity. God, if I give you what I got, you're gonna see who I am. You're gonna see that I'm broken and I got issues and I'm icky and I'm imperfect and I, I can't, I can pretend for an hour at church. I can't pretend all the time. If I give you what I got, you'll see who I am. A lot of us worry about lack. We refuse to give Jesus what we've got because we don't wanna go without. If I give you what I got, Jesus, I won't be able to have what I want. I won't be able to do what I want. You're gonna call me out of some things that I'm really comfortable with. You're gonna call me out of some behaviors and some habits and some ideas and you're gonna change me in ways that are gonna make me uncomfortable. I can't give you what I've got, Jesus, because I don't wanna go without. And a lot of us worry about judgment. We won't give what we've got to Jesus because what will people say? What, what will my family say? I cussed out my family all the way to church and now I'm coming home talking about I'm on fire for the Lord and going on mission trips and doing all this and that for the Lord. What will, my, what will my family say? What will my community say? These are things that get in the way of complete surrender, but I'll tell you this, becoming a partner with God requires complete surrender. You've got to give it all to him. I give you everything that I have. I give you everything that I am. It all belongs to you. The, the, the interesting thing to me is that everything this little boy had was not enough. He was a little boy with little fish and little bread and no theological training and no ministry skills. He, he was not even a candidate to meet Jesus. Do you remember in the New Testament, it talks about how when people were bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed, the disciples rebuked them. We don't have time for your little boy, your little unimportant child to meet the rabbi, the Messiah. Everything this little boy had to offer was dead. Dead fish. Even bread is dead grain plants. But it's funny how when we surrender, even that which is dead can give life. That dead marriage can give life. That dead relationship with your children can give life. You may be sitting here and thinking, I'm too old to lean in the way he's asking me to. Even the dead things can bring life when we surrender them. And that's a part of partnership. And God wants partnership with all of us. So Andrew says, here's this little boy. He's got some fish sticks and some bread rolls and meet Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. That's a really small detail, but I think it's important that have the people sit down because it speaks to organization. And sometimes when we talk about miracles and signs and wonders, we talk like that means that we can't have organization, right? That, that we can't have order. I, I, what I love about this is Jesus is getting ready to do this miraculous thing, but he does so in an organized way. That's real good news because some of us are afraid of the miraculous and the supernatural because we associate miraculous with chaotic. I want you to know miracles and chaos don't necessarily go together. You understand what I'm saying? The spirit moved all through here during the songs. I was over there boohoo crying, right? And, and we let the spirit do whatever he wants to do, but we also have a plan. We also have an order. We say, okay, we're going to do these many, this many songs, and, and this is the songs we're going to do, and then we're going to have the BCC News, and then the speaker's going to come out, and we're going to do off. We have order. We have structure. We can embrace the miraculous and still have organization. Amen? I don't know why he told him to sit. Maybe it was just to get a better sight, right? Maybe to see, see people better but it was a part of the way that he was gonna do this miraculous thing. So he has the men sit down. It says in verse 10, so the men sat down about 5,000 in number. And then he took the loaves and he gave thanks for them. 
And I think that that's really important, that gratitude principle, especially because we see Jesus give thanks for the fish and the loaves before he multiplies them, before there's a lot. He gives thanks for the little before it's a lot. We've got to be a grateful people. We've got to be grateful all the time for everything. And be clear, when I say I am thankful for what I have, it is not me pretending that what I have is more than what it actually is. No, I'm thankful for what I have because I know what God can do with it. I know what God can do with this little bit that I've got, this this little bit that I am. I know what God can do with it, so I'm thankful for it. And when we're grateful for the little... It just tends to go farther. Bible says that he, he took it and when he had given thanks, it said he distributed them to those who were seated. Who did he distribute these loaves to? Let's read it again. He distributed them to those who were seated. Obedience. Just knowing how people are, I just, this is my sanctified imagination now. I just imagine that Jesus says, tell everybody to sit down. And it was a few people who said, oh no, I don't sit on grass. I don't, not in my new tunic. I just can't be bothered. That's not my preference. I don't do that. Oh no, I can't. You wait till Jesus upgrades his ministry and gets some chairs. I'll come back then. I don't do that. I don't, no, no, no. I only sit on concrete. I'm not going to be bothered sitting on grass. You don't get to tell me what to do, Peter. You're not even Jesus. I'm not going to sit down. I just, just knowing how church people are, I just... I just imagine somebody had an attitude about having to sit down. Here's the thing. I don't know that actually people refused to sit down. Maybe they all sat down. But I wonder if people did remain standing, and I wonder if they ate. I'll tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says that the ones who for sure ate were the ones who sat were the ones who were obedient. Obedience unlocks provision. And I wanna be clear that it is not that obedience unlocks provision like you get blessed for, for being good enough. Like if I just follow all the rules, I'll get good things. I don't want you to lean into a workspace theology. But obedience is about recognizing that when God tells us to do something, it's because doing that thing sets us up to live the best life possible, the life that he wants us to live. And so when we do what we're told to do by God, that puts us in the prime position to receive the best that God has for us. So when God gives instructions, we've got to follow him. If God tells you to sit down, have a seat that you might eat, that you might receive the provision that he has for us. And so the Bible says that he distributed the loaves to those who were seated and so also the fish as much as they wanted, as much as they wanted. You know what I love about that? That includes the little boy. He also got to eat as much as he wanted. The same little boy who was probably stressed out. If I give up my lunch, I won't be able to eat. He got to eat so much more than he would have if he had held on to his lunch. If he had refused to give it to God, he got to eat so much more. And that's because becoming a partner with God leads to abundance. You will always have more than enough when you lean into what God is doing. And when we all become partners with God, when we all become partners with God, like when a big group of people come together and decide to become partners with God, like church, we get to be a blessing to all kinds of people and nobody gets left out. I, I, think, I think sometimes we get too comfortable with the idea that some people won't make it to heaven. We become too resolved in that. We just say, oh, well, you know, everybody ain't gonna make it. If we're honest, we get a little elitist about it, don't we? Ooh, we the good Christian club, we are gonna make it. I, listen, I just won't settle for that. I just won't, until Jesus comes back, I'm determined that everybody's gonna make it. I'm determined that everybody, listen, don't add me on Facebook, don't add me on Instagram. I'm determined that everybody who is attached to me is going to make it. And we have to all have that, that mentality, that heart, that everybody, everybody that we're in contact with can make it. Let's pick it up in verse 12. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. And so they gathered them up and filled the 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. 
Ah, oh, that's God math for you. That's partnership. That even the fragments, even the leftovers, even the broken pieces can be satisfying. With God, even the broken things can be that broken marriage, even the broken things, broken relationships, even the broken things, broken bodies. Some of us think that we cannot partner with God because of ailments and physical issues and challenges, but with God, even the broken things can be satisfying. And here's the truth. Partnership with God is satisfying. In fact, it is the most satisfying thing Without partnership with God, you won't be satisfied. You can be the CEO of your company, have risen to the top of your field, and you won't be fully satisfied. You can be in a marriage for 30 and 40 years and be unsatisfied in your marriage. You can have a bank account that's wide and deep and long and be suicidal in part because you will not partner with God in all the areas of your life. And whatever area you withhold from partnership with God, will not be nearly as satisfying until you and your spouse say, hey, we're in a partnership with God. Until you let God partner with you in your career, partner with you in your resources, partner with you in your activities and your timeline, none of these things will be as satisfying as they are meant to be. God calls us into partnership in our whole life. Let's finish with verses 14 through 15. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And perceiving that they were about to come and take Jesus by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. You know, this text is always preached as a really encouraging one. It's always, you know, used to really excite people about miracles and signs and wonders. But if I'm honest, for me, it's actually a really sad text. It's sad because these people had just witnessed Jesus do one of the most miraculous things he has ever recorded having done. And they missed the point. The text says that when they saw what he had done, that they wanted to make him king. That wasn't about worship, that was about power. That was about control. That was about elevating their lives in ways that made them feel good. They missed the point. And you know, a lot of churches and Christians get themselves into trouble because we make power the centerpiece of our partnership. We make the signs and the wonders and the supernatural the centerpiece of our partnership. No, the centerpiece of our partnership is not power, it's the person. These miracles that Jesus did were meant to point to who he is, the Messiah. They thought he was just a prophet. They missed it. And some of us have got to move out of that mindset of coming to church just because we want power, just because we want healing, just because we wanna see miracles. There's nothing wrong with wanting to see miracles, but the miracles are the outgrowth, are the byproduct of the relationship that we come here to develop. We come here for the relationship. I come here because I wanna meet the person and the byproduct, the birth of that relationship is that I get to receive healing and I get to receive miracles and I get to receive deliverance and I get to cast out things that are not like God, but that is not the centerpiece. The centerpiece is the person of Jesus. So I just want to invite you into partnership today. I want you to join the firm. You might have been walking with Jesus for a long time, or you might have just met him today. And maybe it's not, it's not your whole life, but maybe there's a part of your life that you've been hoarding, that you have refused to open up and partner with God in. Maybe you're in a season where God is calling you into new partnership where God is saying, hey, I got some things I want you to do. I got some things I want you to let go of. I got some things I want you to pick up and I got some things I want you to put down and it is scary and you are worried and you are trying to pull away. I wanna invite you to lean all the way in to partnership with God. Partnership is simply an agreement to cooperate toward a common goal. It is an agreement to cooperate toward the common goal. How do I do that, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked, Pastor Dylan. (laughs) Partnership 
requires two things, surrender and agreement. I surrender my life and I agree to what you wanna do with it, Lord. I surrender my gifts and I agree to what you wanna do with them, Lord. I surrender my time and I agree to what you wanna do with it, Lord. I surrender I surrender my agenda and I agree to what you want to do with it, Lord. I surrender my timeline and I agree to what you want to do with it, Lord. I surrender my resources and I agree to what you want to do with it, Lord. I surrender my positions as as a husband, as a father, as an uncle, as a church member. I surrender and I agree. That's all partnership requires of you. What do you need to surrender and where do you need to agree? Search your heart. What do you need to surrender and where do you need to agree? Because I promise you, your surrender and your agreement, your partnership with God will allow you to see 5,000 fed and to eat and be satisfied yourself. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. Father God, we agree and we surrender corporately as a body, but also individually as people who are very diverse and complex and nuanced and complicated and challenging. Lord, we surrender and we agree. We surrender our whole selves and everything that we have and we agree with your plan and your will and your timeline. Whatever you wanna do, Lord, do it. Lord, we say this with with a little bit of trepidation because it's actually really, really hard to surrender and agree. God, I wanna do what I wanna do, but I acknowledge that your way is better. And I acknowledge that I need your help in surrendering and agreeing. And what I'm thankful for, Lord, is that you are willing to help me, that you are willing to walk with me, that you are willing to carry me, that I don't have to do it by myself, and that you're not angry with me or disappointed in me when I fall short. Father, I lift up my friends who are, who are in this journey with me and who are trying to surrender and agree. And I just pray that you would give us what we need to do that, the courage and the strength that you would expand the faith in our hearts, that we can truly trust you enough to do this. Father, we wanna be your partners. We need you as a partner in our lives. So God, settle some of these truths deep into our hearts that we might experience radical transformation and that we might see great miracles, great signs and wonders. We lift all this up to you in the name of your son, Jesus, amen.